Hello and welcome to the Marine Conservation Happy Hour. This is Dr. Scarlet Smash. I have Dr. Kraken here. We're doing one of our special live recordings um, that we'll post on YouTube. These you will not hear on our podcast. So always make sure that you subscribe because this is, uh, it'll come out just for those people that are on our YouTube channel. So today we will be talking about Manatees 101. <laughs> Dr. Kraken, uh, we've been talking a lot about manatees lately because manatees have been in the news a lot. Um, yes, not doing very not well in Florida. Doing, not doing well, but uh, we decided let's just talk about manatees and some of the really awesome facts about them. Yeah, manatees don't get quite as much love as some of the other marine mammals. So all we really hear about them is how they keep getting hit by boats and so on. So we thought we'd give a little bit of an introduction to manatee biology. But so what are you drinking? Oh, I'm drinking coffee at the moment because I'm in professorial lecture mode. Oh, well, I'm drinking ginger beer. And I just wanted to give a shout out. Do you see this excellent um, necklace from Now Brace Yourself? Yeah, yeah. It's a I fantastic very Game you're, of thrones -y today. Yeah, you're, you're, you have that sort of, um, sort of uh, Khaleesi vibe going on here yeah if your hair was a little of, bit paler kind of, yeah, kind of. Yeah. I'm, I'm more cooler than Khaleesi I feel like maybe but... slightly <laughs> Melisandre the uh the fire witch yeah. yes yes and then I have my um Pendragon costume beautiful love it I love her so much and um <laughs> so that is what I'm wearing Dr. Kraken what are you doing what am I doing uh well doing I'm wearing today? my wearing my nice uh my nice new jacket here from etsy although i have to say it's i thought it was going to be made from linen and it's made from a sort of man-made fiber so it's really really hot but, it kind of looks plasticky yeah it's, it's a bit shiny it's a bit shiny it's, it's not too bad it's not too bad it's just quite hot um mm -hmm. You know, so I, I might have to try and find something which is a uh, sort of handmade, properly done, properly tailored. You gotta get, well, you gotta do to. the expense, man. I mean, like, <laughs> you got to pay for the quality. You know what I mean? Well, we have a little trip to the Maryland Renaissance Festival coming up oh. soon, so I think I'm going to be trawling around there for something nice. Give myself a, a little bit of a treat. Good, excellent. Well, let's talk <laughs> about manatees. Manatees. So let me see how much you remember from doing a marine mammal class with me way back in the day. And this is oh my how goodness. we actually like, met. I'm going to remember. I <laughs> let's let's 20, 20 years ago. Uh, manatees live a, a really long time like us. They can live 40 to 60 years old. Uh, manatees love to eat grass. And we just mentioned in our one of our last podcasts that they eat 10 times their weight. <laughs> like something extremely intense like that. No, oh, 100 pounds. That's right. They eat 100 pounds a day. That's right. And they weigh about 1,000 pounds, right? Uh, depending on the type of manatee. There are three yeah. types of manatee. But yeah, the largest, the West uh, West Indian manatee, the ones yeah, that you see pounds. in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah um manatees uh, let's see what else about manatees i really i'm trying i'm trying to even can you remember that. where they get their name from <gasps> manatees name mm. no it comes from manatus which is actually means breast and the reason they're called that is they have nipples underneath their armpits yes. and so when they're nursing their offspring they kind of hold them almost like a human baby and this is one of the reasons why they were sometimes mistaken for mermaids, mermaids that they would be seen floating in the water with their offspring sort of held held to their um axillary their armpit uh teats and it looks kind of well 
from a distance looks kind of like a mermaid. You have to remember that the days when people were discovering manatees in the West Indies, the average sailor was getting through maybe one to three pints of rum a day. Yeah, because they couldn't so, have fresh water. Absolutely. So they had to put rum in they their water. They had to live off to... of something else. <laughs> So, you know, sometimes mm, eyesight may be not quite so good. Not quite so good. In fact, Christopher... What is that? I haven't seen a beautiful woman in a... Oh, oh a close enough. Close enough. So, in fact, Christopher Columbus, sailing past the island of Hispani Hispaniola, thought he saw mermaids and wrote in his log that they were not as attractive as he was led to believe. <laughs> so... You're bald. <laughs> <laughs> and the area that he was sailing past is actually now today a manatee protected area in the Dominican Republic so so they've been there for a very very long time so the name manatee comes from manatus and their scientific name Sirenia comes from this sort of mermaid legend the sirens the the mythical creatures that would lure men to the rocks. So that's where the Latin name comes from. Now, there are actually three types of manatee. Mm -hmm. There's also their cousin, the dugongs as well. But before we get into the three different species, now, can you remember what is their closest land relative? Well, I would think it's a cow because of how much it likes to eat grass, but it's actually an elephant. Yes, yes. And in fact, if you look at their skin, you see how crinkly their skin is. It looks very elephant-like. If you look at their teeth, they look very much like elephant teeth. And the dugongs actually have short, stubby tusks. If you also look at the inside of them, they do look very elephant-like as well. So if you ever do a uh, uh, a necropsy, a sort of post-mortem of a stranded manatee. They look very much like elephants on the inside too. So that's their closest land relative. So they're basically aquatic elephants. Now, I mentioned that there are three different species of manatee. So there is the West Indian manatee, which is split up into two subspecies. One, the famous Florida manatee, and the second is the Antillean manatee, which is basically the, an the manatee in the rest of the sort of Caribbean region, places like the Dominican Republic and so forth. Then we have the Amazonian manatee, which looks very different. It's a freshwater manatee. Its skin is smoother. So it looks like the elephant has been having lots and lots and lots of moisturizer. Oh, it's also wow. sort of darker colored and it has a white belly patch. And then the third one is the West African manatee. And that manatee, there's a lot of concern about because its distribution is really, really broad. It's found on the coast of something like 20 different countries in Africa. And it's also found up river systems, including a lake which is really quite far inshore in Africa sort of in the middle of Africa and right. it's got into this lake because sometimes the river systems that lead to this lake get flooded and they move upstream now the other interesting or oh, I should also mention the dugongs as well so the dugongs are a cousin of the manatees as I mentioned they have little short stubby tusks but the other difference between the dugongs and the manatees is that the manatees have got spatula-like tails, so rounded tails, kind of like a flattened spoon, whereas the dugongs have got a tail very similar to the tail of a whale or a dolphin, so crescent shape, plus these little short tusks. Now, so the dugongs are a cousin, but they're found in the Indo-Pacific. So people, if they see dugongs, are often seeing them in places like the Great Barrier Reef, um, sometimes in the Indo-Pacific, maybe if you're on the coast of Thailand or Borneo or somewhere like that, then you might encounter right. the dugongs. Mm -hmm. So again, that's like more like Asia, right? In, in Asia waters goes all the way down to um, 
Australia, right? And yes, all the way down Australia. All the way to the east coast of Africa, right? Um, sometimes right the way around to the east coast of Africa. Yeah. So in places like the Arabian Gulf or the Red Sea, they have dugongs there. In fact, there are lots of legends in the area about mermen that have got beards. Um, people who are sort of horror fans might have heard of the creature Dagon, and that's actually an ancient god from the Middle East, which is a merman with a beard. Mm. So that might possibly be one That's place the where the name merman I've ever came from, the Dagons. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine like Jason Momoa with a fish body. And bald. A and bald, bald, a bald, yes. <laughs> yeah, so maybe not, maybe not so much Jason Momoa, but that guy from Men in Kilts who oh, goes around yes. with Jamie Fraser, you yes. know, bald yes. head and a big bushy beard. Yeah, um, is it Gordon McTavish? So yes, a bit like him, but in aquatic form. And in fact, in the Bible, uh, there's some references to dugongs. So there's uh, references to tents and sandals mm -hmm. being made from a type of leather, which mm -hmm. is sometimes mistranslated as badger, which they don't really have. Um, but one of the translations is dugong. So they probably use them to make a lot of items back in the day. And uh, the manatees and dugongs also have this sort of reputation of being let's just say the, the tastiest of the marine mammals. They were no! very often hunted, very often hunted. And in fact, in the Caribbean, the sort of um, indigenous name for manatees was buca. And in the early days of sort of the golden era of piracy in the 1600s, 1700s, a lot of pirate bases were located where manatees were because they were a source of food that they could eat. They also actually have a certain amount of vitamin C in them too. Mm. So you could eat them and not get scurvy. And they would kill the manatees and then they would basically smoke them or barbecue them and sell the meat sometimes to passing ships. Oh. Uh, and they would sell on this boucan meat. And the people who smoked the meat were called boucaniers or buccaneers. And some of these would go to the ships, hey, come and buy my wares. Now I'm going to mug you and take you hostage. And we have to get money off of you and your goods. And then they would run back to the islands of Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, or Haiti. And that's where the name Buccaneer comes from in terms of pirates. So a link between manatees and pirates. Now, the other thing that's particularly interesting about the manatees and dugongs, as we mentioned, they eat grass, so they're the only herbivorous. Herb yeah, herbivores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of the marine mammals, and um, they, all, they both also have really good hearing. They're they, really poor eyesight, but they have really good hearing. Unfortunately, their hearing is not great in the frequencies of the motorboats. Sometimes. Oh well, okay. This is yes. I mean, I I I don't even hear well underwater when there's motorboats. Have you ever heard the call of a uh, of a dugong? It actually sounds like mice. They're really like high pitch and squeaky. Um, like, I've heard <laughs> manatees, and manatees are like little. <laughs> oh my god! Just absolutely. Adorable, love, oh, I love it. Yes, okay. Well, anyways, so yeah. these really big animals, really squeaky voice, a little bit like my my cat Wesley, who's like twenty five pounds and has the the highest pitched, squeakiest voice, and uh, like Wesley likes to eat too because they're eating all this vegetation. It's pretty low in nutrients, as we mentioned before. They had to eat loads and loads and loads. But to digest all this grass, they need a really, really long gut because it takes a long time to digest. It doesn't give them a huge amount of energy. And to get around this problem of being low energy, they also have a low metabolic rate. So their metabolic rate is way, way lower, which means that they're slow, they're sluggish, and they don't produce as much body heat 
as you would expect. So they're kind of like the opposite of sea otters. Sea otters, high metabolic rate, eating all the time, but eating sort of like high quality, high protein food like shellfish. And they, they would generate lots and lots of heat. Whereas manatees is kind of the opposite. They don't generate much heat and they do have problems with getting cold in the winter. So in the winter, because of this low heat generation, low metabolic rate, they often basically go to hot springs mm -hmm. to keep themselves warm. So in Florida, you'll often see them in these warm waters in the Florida winter, huddling around power stations and things like that, because this low metabolic rate means they're susceptible to hypothermia. So that's one of the big conservation threats. And unfortunately, it's their anatomy that leads to that. So yeah, manatees are kind of like the, the opposite of you smash. Uh, although they eat a lot, they don't generate much body heat and they're very I mean, slow I, and I cannot handle cold, so don't even. I would be huddling <laughs> with the manatees. I'm just like, In the hot it's spring. 70 degrees. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> It's so cold. And also because they're eating all this vegetation, another famous thing about the manatees is that it, with these big guts, they get very, very gassy. So they are rather infamous for fiber. breaking wind. Great fiber. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, they're, they're able to do all that they need to do, poop out really nice and easy because they got all that good fiber. <laughs> Well, and, and lots and lots of gases, which actually makes them kind of like a, a sort of a Zeppelin or an airship. They have so much gas that they have to have thick, heavy bones <laughs> in order to provide them with buoyancy. They also have two diaphragms too, which means they can inflate and deflate the lungs separately. So it's a little bit like the ballast tanks of a submarine. So they can inflate one lung and sort of go up on one side and then deflate it and then inflate the other and go up on the other side. So buoyancy through all this stomach gas counteracted by thick, know, thick yeah. bones, which look very similar to their elephant cousins. And um, yes, they have two lungs which they can inflate and deflate separately which gives them this sort of buoyancy. So they control their movements by using gases rather than like the dolphins do using their fins quite so much. So yeah, like a slow energy blimp. blimp. Yes, yes absolutely. Like a blimp. Not, not an airplane, yeah. a Zeppelin. So, you know, if they were a type of transport, probably quite environmentally friendly. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I would do. I'd be this little crustacean just hopping on a manatee like, like yeah. Give me a ride. Give me a ride, Mr. Blimp. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. So <laughs> conservation issues, we've mentioned one of them. They're very susceptible to hypothermia. So they do huddle in these hot springs areas, which also mean that they're very susceptible to people to harassing them or in locations where boats might go through. In Florida, infamously, they get hit by boats quite a lot, which is a big problem. Also impacted by red tides too. So toxic algae accumulates on their food, which they eat. Their seagrass beds are disappearing in many areas. So they're having problems getting food. Some places they're still hunted in Africa. In some locations, they're still hunted because they're tasty. Um, their skin is taken for leather. Sometimes their body parts are used for um, sort of medicines and magic. In Africa as well, because they feed on vegetation, sometimes they swim into rice paddies and eat people's rice crops. So there's sometimes conflict there. Sometimes they blunder into fishing nets. If you imagine a manatee swimming through a fishing net is going to destroy it. You know, they're big, they're heavy. So it could impact someone's livelihood. And so there's quite a bit of conflict in areas too. Plus also general issues like pollution, habitat loss. So they're facing a lot of conservation problems and conservation threats. So we, we really need to sort of highlight how cool manatees and dugongs are. And, you know, they're, they're sort of the... You know, sort of
black sheep in the marine mammals, they don't get as much love as some of the other species do. So we need to go out there and help save the manatees, particularly I'm in the Exactly West right. I don't understand that. Why are they forgotten? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're I guess a strange thing to me because, I mean, I guess even when I was in school, I mean, we were always focusing on the bigger, you know, the bigger mammals. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like some of the seals. Some of the seals don't get much love, and yet they're very, very cute. So, so why strange. is it that whales and dolphins get yeah. all this attention and some of the other ones don't? So bizarre, I... because they are adorable, and that's usually what we gravitate towards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're adorable in this sort of, uh, you clumsy, know, this sort of clumsy, well, yeah. chubby, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, like uh, dad board four in Ragnarok. Oh, stop it. Stop <laughs> it. What about stellar sea cows? Did you mention anything about them? Ah, stellar sea cows. So now stellar sea cows are a very, very large cousin to the dugongs. So they're more closely related to the dugongs. They have a crescent-shaped tail, but they were found in much colder waters and they were That huge. is wild. They're cold. They actually do like cold water. Yeah, they were their cousins. huge, huge animals. They apparently had lots and lots of fat. Um, According to according to the reports on them, they were so fat and buoyant, they couldn't actually sink. So they were very much like airships. They just sort of floated around oh, no. eating kelp. Instead of eating seagrass, they fed on kelp. Mm. And their chief predator was probably something like killer whales. So there are tales of them defending themselves by sort of align themselves with their tails outmost and um, splashing them around, which you imagine a killer whale, a 20 something foot big tail slapping you, that's going to keep you out of the way. And they would have their babies in the middle of the group oh. protected by the adults. But unfortunately the hunters used to use that. So they would go up and they would kill the babies because they knew the adults would stay nearby and then they could finish off the adults and because of their thick blubber layer and as i said manatees and dugongs apparently have very tasty meat a lot of the hunters for sea otters would capture these stellar sea cows and use them for food while they were trapping sea otters That's and also right. actually went extinct and they went extinct. And actually, some of the indigenous populations in um, the areas, the island areas uh, in between Russia and Alaska also drove some of the stellar sea cow populations extinct too. Ah. When they basically first settled some of these offshore islands, they found these populations of stellar sea cows and they tended to disappear relatively rapidly too. So there was a history of extinctions of stellar sea cows through these really, really remote islands in between Russia and Alaska, where I guess they survived because humans couldn't get there. And as soon as humans did arrive there, boom, they disappeared oh, very rapidly. An easy target. That's so very easy bad. target. Yes. So they went extinct in 1768. Yes, they went extinct within about 20 or so years of them being discovered on Bering Island. No, what and the heck? They also have a couple of other populations that existed um, during recent history. Uh, Laura Lake Creera, who we know, yeah. discovered another population on St. Lawrence Island, which disappeared probably roughly about 500 to 700 AD. Um, during the sort of middle uh, the middle ages warm period mm. it got warmer people started expanding sailing further afield discovered these islands with these stellar sea cows on and then basically hunted them to extinction so sad just absolutely so sad well thanks dr kraken uh, <laughs> <laughs> pulling out your lecture from from the college days well one thing I'd like to mention before we sign off, because we started talking about mermaids, there are legends of mermaids off the coast of I Iceland. So there's been some suggestion that maybe when people first settled Iceland, perhaps there might have been some sort of stellar sea cow there. 
because um, during the medieval warm period, the Northwest Passage was possibly open, like it's opening now with climate change. Maybe they had stellar sea cows that went all the way from these remote islands off of um, Russia and Alaska, perhaps over to Iceland, because some of these legends of Icelandic mermaids sound very, very similar to the descriptions um, of stellar sea cows. And perhaps when they first started settling Iceland and Greenland and locations like that, maybe the early Norse found these animals and again, perhaps hunted them to extinction, but never sort of wrote the details down beyond the, their sort of sagas and legends. So perhaps there it's were a North Atlantic Tennessee County. It is very sad because imagine seeing something like that 25 feet long manatee cruising around, very faithful to their kids. Yeah. Oh, oh, very sad. So sad. <sighs> so don't let manatees and dugongs go the way of the stellar no, sea cow. Let's that not. is our message. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely our message. Well, Dr. Kraken, thanks so much for joining me. Appreciate it. I'm completely done with my with my drink right now. Well, I'll have to start breaking out the champagne. Yes, we need to start moving on to the alcohol. And thanks for joining us on YouTube for this yes. very special episode. And please subscribe, like so we can keep doing more for you. We appreciate it and happy conservation.